All right, good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Danae Aber. I'm the executive director of the Louisiana Rural Health Association. First of all, I'd like to apologize for my voice. I am a little under the weather today, so I'm sure you can hear that, but we'll, we'll just power through and we'll be good. Um, so thank you for joining us for the Rural Infection Prevention and Control Training Program webinar. Um, LRHA is really happy to be able to pre present this program um, and the webinar series uh, with sponsorship by Well Ahead Louisiana and in partnership with Southern Evals. Um, today's session is part one of the Hospital Basics of Infection Prevention and Control. Part two of the webinar will be held on July 14th, so be sure to visit our website to register for that session. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. It will be available along with a copy of the slides on our website at lrha.org. And I will drop a direct link to that, uh, the page in the chat. Your lines are automatically muted when you join the session. Please remain on mute until you're asked to speak or until we get to a Q&A portion of the webinar so we can prevent background noise. After the webinar, we will send you a brief survey link uh, link in the chat and also via email. We do ask that you complete that survey. Um, it's very brief, it should only take you a minute or two. Um, it is required for our grant evaluation of the project and it helps us to make sure that we continue to improve all of our future events. Um, and with that, I would like to welcome Taylor Catano. He's the founder and CEO of Southern Evals. Taylor is a board certified infection preventionist and has previous experience as a frontline front line nurse specializing in critical care in both the medical and surgical intensive care setting. So thank you so much, Taylor, for being here, and I will hand off to you. All right, Danae, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody, to the second webinar in our series. Um, and today, we are getting into the nuts and bolts of your infection prevention and control program. Um, you know, we separate these things into three different sections, and we're just going to get started and get right into it. So let me share my screen. Let's see, there we go. All right, and we will get this going. All right, again, um, welcome, RI, the Rural Infection Control Training Program. Uh, we're excited to get this started. You know, many times, uh, we get contacted and uh, we are asked, you know, look, I just got into this role. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what I need in this program, or I was just handed this and I've got a ton of binders. What do I do from here? Well, hopefully today can provide some clarity as to what you want. So to start, good morning, shout outs. Um, I would love to uh, just get to know everybody that's on. Let's start. Uh, what I'll do is I'm going to click uh, a button uh, to ask to unmute yourself. If you can unmute yourself and then just tell us where you're from, how long you've been in the role, and if you've signed up yet for your facility uh, to have your on-site walkthrough. So I'm going to start with Miss Tia. There we go. Well, let's see. Boom, ask to unmute. Miss Tia. Hi, I'm from Dickinson County Hospital. I've been in my role uh, nine months okay. and so I'm quite new to infection prevention. Just like how you said, I've been handed all these binders and I'm like, what do I do here? <laughs> nope, totally understand, totally understand. Well, today what we'll be doing is shedding some light on those foundational elements that you'll need to have. Um, whether you're state uh, or whether you're certified by the state or licensed by the state, or if you do have a crediting body, we put both of those in there. So no, great to have you excited, uh, excited to get started and uh, to, to get to know you better. So, okay, let's go to uh, Richard Hinton. Let's go there real quick. Morning, Taylor. Can you hear me? Hey, sure can. Good morning. I'm, uh, Actually, from Reeves Memorial Medical Center in Bernice, it's a critical access hospital. Been here about three years, walked in flat, caught COVID epidemic right to start off the first year I was here. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so I kind of learned the hard way around. I'm still way behind the curve on what I need to know. And of course, with the COVID epidemic, a lot of educational opportunities were stomped down. So I'm really enjoying picking up what you're going to be get, handing me out. I sure need it. 
Oh, no, look, and really infection control, infection prevention and control has been on everybody's mind, no matter what industry you are in. So I totally understand there was a lot that was getting thrown at us and a lot of things changing. So, um, you know, hopefully today we can we can maybe shed some light on some of those basics that uh, we can either fine tune or, or help you develop. So, no, great to meet you. Awesome. All right. Well, we will get cranked up. Um, like Danae said, um, this will be uh, recorded and this will be available. The slides will be available at the link that she provides. Um, so, um, so, you know, so those are going to be available. What I, what my main goal today is, is I want to cover some big pieces. I, you know, I really, you know, the best thing today would not be taking down as many notes as you can on the content that's in the presentation. It would be print those out. It really would be taking those notes on the little pieces uh, those little nuggets that I'm giving on what we've seen is important to focus on in the different elements. So I just wanted to put that out there. But again, who is Southern Evals? Uh, we are a Louisiana-born regulatory compliance firm. My name is Taylor Catano. I am a board certified infection preventionist. And what I do on a daily basis is I work with infection preventionists or healthcare facilities in uh, either developing their infection prevention and control program or overseeing that or helping them get through regulatory survey uh, successfully. So, like I said, today is the first hospital basics, all the foundational elements that are needed for you to have a compliant and successful infection prevention and control program. So, like we talked about last time, and I think I, I recognize some names from last time, but um, when we talk about the three P's in infection prevention and control, that's how we kind of segment this thing is the three P's are paperwork. Number one is the paperwork, those things that you're going to need to have either binder or digitally available that your surveyors are going to want you to have and those resources that are available for staff in different situations that gives them guidance. Um, number two is policy and procedure. So, you know, whether it's we've been handed policies from, uh, you know, the 1600s or if we have policies that have been recently updated, I want to go through some of the main policies that we've seen that you need to have per the regulations and then give you some guidance as to what uh, the regulators are looking for in those or things that we really feel like you need to have. And the last thing is practice. So practice would be your environmental rounds. That would be your quality program. Um, that would be anything that you need to be doing on an annually, monthly, quarterly, or a daily basis uh, in your facility. This webinar, we're going to take a deep dive into the paperwork, policy, and procedures. Um, and make sure that you have those foundational elements, or if you do, if things need to be updated, that we do update those things. Okay, remember, you can make a difference. We've all been through the COVID-19 pandemic. We've all seen changes. We've all seen how infection prevention and control are such a huge piece of healthcare, not only healthcare, but just life. Um, so know this, know that you are in a position to make changes, uh, to give guidance, to give education, and to be a leader in your community uh, where folks that maybe, maybe they're, they're scared, uh, maybe they don't know where to turn, you can be that leader. So I want to encourage you, you really can make a difference and you already are. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about is paperwork. Items that are needed to be completed and updated according to your regulatory standard for a compliant infection prevention and control program. So the first thing we talk about is this is, this is kind of just something we do in the firm. We call it the IC Bible. And what we, what we mean by the IC Bible is regulatory agencies, they all have the same thing in common. They've got specific things that they're required to look for. Um, and what we found through years and years of survey is that not only if you have those items, but if you have those items separated, tabbed out, and exactly organized as to what they're going to be looking for, um, you've got a much easier experience with surveyors. You've also got a much easier experience for whenever folks that are outside of your department are looking for answers or looking for guidance as to where you're headed in your program. You got it all laid out so that they can find those things and it's easily easy to understand the flow of that. Um, so with state or joint commission or any accrediting body, having that IC Bible uh, with all of these different elements that we're talking about organized in a certain fashion has, you know, has really uh, given our clients and some of the folks that we work with great success. So like we say, just like this, it's a check off the list. So in the IC Bible, um, we talked about this last time, you know, of the thousands of surveyors that go out there and work throughout the country, less than 5% specialize in infection prevention and control. So what does this mean? 
That means that they're given a set of standards that they're going to be looking at, and they're going to go down that checklist. They're going to make sure that those things are in place. And as you see on this, on the right side of your page, these are the items that we recommend that you have in your binder um, tabbed out so that you have the evidence that you are in compliance for those things. So those things are clinical authority qualification. Um, and we're going to go through all these items, but basically that is deeming you the infection preventionist and why you're qualified to do that job. Second thing is your program plan. That's going to be the, the guideline of everything you do in your infection prevention and control program. Your risk assessment and your goals, that's going to be identifying what issues you have in your facility and then setting goals based off of those priorities. Um, program evaluation, how did we do? Evaluating what you did the year previous and then taking that to either edit your program or alter it your program or say we've resolved those things we're going to move on uh, and continue to do good work. Uh, policy and procedures next that's going to be um, any policy or procedure any item that we have in infection prevention and control. Uh, you got to have a policy behind what you're doing and that policy needs to be accurate and speak to what you are actually doing. Um, we're going to talk about the, the, the issues you can have with your policies and what best practices when it comes to those. Uh, IC committee minutes, you know, how often are we supposed to have those? What do we even need in those? Um, we're going to get into that. And then also quality PDCA data. That's going to be a section that we talk about in the next webinar. But um, what are those items that we need to track? Um, how do we go through a quality cycle to make sure that we're correcting things? So if you want to take a picture with your phone, these are the things that we have tabbed out in our IC Bible that uh, we've had great success with our regulators and it covers a lot of what you need in your program. Um, so first thing is clinical authority. CMS says that, you know, um, we have to designate one individual as the infection control officer and we have to have evidence that they're qualified or maintain qualification. Joint Commission says the same thing. We identify the individual responsible for infection prevention and control. And when they don't have the expertise, either they get education or they consult with somebody who does. So the problem we see here is many times the easiest thing, uh, this is the easiest thing to have evidence of. It's to name who the preventionist is, is to put down what their education is. Um, but a lot of times we find that that is missing and it's an easy thing for surveyors to go back on and say, hey, you got somebody in here, they're not qualified or they don't have the ed education. So what we recommend are these three things. So the first three things that we think of when it comes to clinical authority, giving you the ability to do what you do, naming you as that point person is number one, an acknowledgement. A really easy acknowledgement, it says this person or you are responsible for the infection prevention and control program. They're gonna be managing everything in our program. We give them authority. We're gonna give them supplies. We're gonna make sure that they have what they need to do what they need to do. We're also gonna respect their responsibilities and allow them to implement precautions or do anything that is in their job description to make sure that we are preventing infections from spreading to patients or our staff. An acknowledgement. It's a really easy thing to put in place. Uh, that way you've got leadership buy-in. They're naming you as that infection preventionist and you can move forward uh, having that documentation. Next thing is being a, a member of APIC. So the biggest thing that surveyors will never able to say exactly what a uh, qualified amount of education is. Um, it's kind of it's kind of up to their judgment. But the one thing we've seen that is consistent is if you are a member of APIC, that is the first step. Even if you've not had training in infection control, becoming a member of APIC, getting involved in your APIC regions, that's one way to show that you are actively engaged and learning about what you're going to be doing in your role. And then the last piece is oversight. So if you have those things and um, you can't get to any educational resource, you can always have somebody uh, oversee what you're doing. They can either do an initial training with you or they can be just that point person. Uh, that oversight can come in the form of an infectious disease doctor, a medical director, or somebody certified. You know, a lot of times what we do is me as a board certified preventionist is we help put all these things in place, set that foundation for a preventionist, and just there's that resource. So all those things count, but evidence of education is key. So when you think about that first tab, you know, make sure that you've got, number one, you've been approved. Um, a job description is not a bad thing to have. I would always recommend being a member of APIC. And if you need oversight, who's going to be your contact that when you have questions, you're going to reach out to, or where is your education or your experience in that field that will evidence that standard. All right. Next thing is the big three. 
So we call it the big three because it is clearly identified in regulatory compliance or in the regulations that these things are absolutely needed. So what are the big three? Big three are the program plan, risk assessment, and the program evaluation. And we're gonna go through those three right now. So in that second tab, you've got your program plan. So if you can imagine a program plan, this is gonna be like a 10,000 foot view of everything that is involved in your infection prevention and control program. Um, CMS says this, the officer can provide evidence that the hospital has developed general infection control policies and procedures, and they're based on nationally recognized guidelines applicable with state and federal law. Joint Commission puts it like this, you need an infection prevention and control plan. And then based off of the risk set goals, uh, we set the goals to minimize the transmission of infection. Um, survey problem, infection control plan hasn't been updated since 1889. You know, it's been the same one uh, over and over. We haven't updated it. We haven't added different service lines if we've changed those. So that's the biggest issues that we find. Um, you know, program plans usually are only updated on an annual basis, or if you've got a new threat like COVID-19, that was something that we had to add to a bunch of the facilities that we work with plans. Or if you add a new service line, you know, say you weren't doing surgery or you weren't doing uh, endoscopy and now you're adding that, that's a whole nother element that infection control has to be involved with. So you wanna make sure um, that your program plan has those things. Another issue that we see is with Joint Commission, uh, especially when it comes to IC010401 is that they have specific things that they want you to have as your goals. Not only prioritize, but they have these specific things that they want and then those are in uh, the regulation, um, but they're looking for those things. Um, program plan, you know, like I said, this is an overview of everything that you do. And these are some, some key points that we always mention in our program plan. And we'll go through those. So number one, the purpose and the elements of your program. So when we talk about elements, um, we're talking about, you know, um, what are my responsibilities? What is leadership given me the ability to do? Um, what all is involved in the infection control program? And those elements may be some of the following, you know, authority and responsibility, like we said, having, having that included in there, having what your role is as a preventionist, that's a great thing to have in your plan. Your reporting methodology, what are you reporting? Are you reporting to state and local authorities? Are you reporting to a governing body, which then rolls up to med exec? Um, how do you report different things that go on in your facility? It's good to have an outline of that. Employee health. What are we doing with employee health to make sure that our staff is protected or that we're doing something to make sure that they have all the resources they need if there was an incident? Um, outbreak, influx of disease. We always like to put this in our program plan because it is a big piece of uh, what's been going on in the nation. You know, with, with an influx of patients with COVID-19, uh, your plan needs to speak to some of those things that we do. Now we will have policy on that, but your plan can also give some very basics on what you do. Um, surveillance plan evaluation. You know, what are we looking at? Are we looking at hospital acquired infections versus community acquired? Um, are we doing environmental rounds in the form of surveillance? Are we monitoring our antibiotic use? You know, we want to talk about what we are looking at in our plan uh, on, a, on a monthly, on an annually, and on a quarterly basis, and then also how we evaluate those items. Um, program annual goals, we like to say, uh, like I said, the Joint Commission has specific things that they like to see, but those program annual goals we like to include in our program plan. Um, and then also references. You know, if you've got references from the CDC, from WHO, from APIC, um, it's a great thing to have in your program plan to have those references. So uh, one thing that I will mention is I know what I'm gonna do with my team is we're gonna try to have some template resources that we put on our website uh, for this program so that you can go through and click on those to see kind of what we put in our plans and different elements. Uh, also, some of our template policies, we're going to have those available for you, and I will link that in, um, in our, one of our emails that we send out. Okay, so that was your program plan, 10,000 foot view. That's our second tab. That's going to be something that is absolutely looked at. Next thing on your third tab is your risk assessment. So what is a risk assessment? I don't know if I've done one, but I put a picture here. You may have seen something similar to this, or you may have something similar, uh, but what this does is this identifies the top priority items in your facility. CMS says you need to utilize a risk assessment process to pick out uh, the priority, prioritize quality indicators 
uh, Joint Commission says you need to identify risk for acquiring and transmitting infections. So what's our problem with the survey? The risk assessment has key components that need to be included while you're assessing your facility. So we want to make sure that your risk assessment has all the elements that are needed. When you are looking at your facility, there's two pieces. You've got a narrative piece and you've got a chart piece. What the narrative does is the narrative talks about a couple things and we'll get into that on this next slide. So the narrative talks about your scope of services. Okay, what do you do? Do you provide surgery? Do you provide inpatient care? Do you provide swing bed care? Do you provide outpatient services? Um, that's gonna give you the scope. How many beds do you have? It's, it's, a, it's a place for you to identify, you know, areas that may uh, have infection prevention and control integrated into them and what services that you provide that you will be looking for and that you're assessing if there's an issue. Uh, community demographics, you know, where are you? Are you in an urban area? Um, where there's a lot of homelessness? Are you in a rural area where there may be, um, you know, issues like tick bites or different things uh, that are kind of out there um, that we don't see in an urban area? You know, look at your community demographics and see what you may find as issues with that. Local pattern of disease. Um, you look at what's prevalent in your area. Uh, is there any trends? Is there any things that need to, you need to focus on, especially that you feel like you'll see in your facility? Um, you're looking at the local pattern of disease. Uh, fourth thing, TB parish profile. You know, what, is, what does TB look like in your parish? Um, and, and what is your percentage? How often do you see that? You know, is it going to be a huge risk? Or is it going to be something very low risk, but we have what we need in that? Uh, national concerns, of course, we always want to talk about what's going on. You know, the national concerns that we've flip-flopped through is the uh, flumonia is, um, you know, uh, when they had the, uh, the swine flu, whenever we had Ebola, and most recently COVID, you know, those national concerns change. So this is where you need to look at that from a risk assessment standpoint and say, what's going on in the nation right now? And will that be something that I face? Uh, patient factors, you know, uh, do you have a rather healthy patient that comes in or do you have a patient that is very sickly, has a lot of comorbidities? Uh, do you have, you know, uh, psychiatric patients that come in? That's a whole, you know, another, uh, uh, you know, realm of, of things that you've got to look at when it comes to those patients. You know, what are your patient factors that are going to that are going to affect how you are preventing uh, infections and, and how those would be transmitted in your facility. Uh, surveillance and identified risks. So what you're looking at is if you've had anything from the previous year and you've identified those as risks in your facility or you may have had issues with those, you wanna look at those. And then also your prioritized risks, which will give you your goals. Now, how do we get prioritized risks? And this is how. So they've got plenty of charts out there. This is the one that we use. But um, your risk assessment chart is going to be, you are doing this and you are judging, you take what the risk event would be and you say, okay, what's the probability this risk will occur? You know, has it happened in my facility? Did we have an issue with it last year? What's the probability that uh, I can see this? Um, and has it been an issue in the past? That's where you're going to rank out what that is. Next thing you're going to look at is what's the severity? You know, if this was to happen in the facility, would this cause an outbreak? Would this cause uh, more people to be at risk? Um, you know, we're going to risk that out. And you can see it says, is it life-threatening, permanent harm, temporary harm, or no harm at all? And then the last thing is, how well prepared are we to manage that risk? Do we have the supplies? Have we done the education? Or we have the isolation room? You know, for different things, uh, how well are we prepared to manage that? Now, what you're going to do is you're going to go through this chart, you're going to rank those things out, and you're going to take whatever was, you know, your data from last year and the year previous. Uh, also, whatever your opinion is of what you see in your facility, and you're going to plug that in here. And what you see is you get a ranking on the right side as to what those priorities are. From those priorities, you can make the educated uh, call as to what you need to focus on. And what that looks like, that looks like this. So we set it up in a chart in our risk assessment to get our goals. And when it comes to goals, we want to make sure that the thing that was the highest issue, which as you can see, was COVID-19 for this uh, risk assessment that we did, that we're focusing on that first. 
Now with COVID-19, since it is a risk, what is a goal that we can do uh, to help decrease the spread of that or mitigate uh, exposure? You know, what are we aiming at doing? So with our goals, you know, we always emphasize you want to make sure you have smart goals. You know, I've had uh, some facilities say that I want to get rid of COVID. Well, how do we measure that? You know, now when we say 100% of COVID-19 positive patients are isolated per the procedure in 2022, that's something we can measure. You know, if we've got patients and we've got an isolation protocol and we're following that and we're monitoring that, that's something that we can abstract and actually track. Now, there are also other things when we talk about accomplishing a goal, like what are the items that we need to do to accomplish that goal? And those are in the form of objectives and strategies. If objectives, if you can imagine objectives as being the macro, these are not as important as what your strategies are, which is the micro. So your objectives are gonna be those concepts like screening every patient at the door, limiting visitation, very, very broad statements. Your strategies are gonna be what you really nail down on to say, this is what we're gonna do to aid in or decrease the transmission or what we're gonna do to help accomplish our goal. So as you can see in the strategies right here, you can see continue to perform temperature screening and ask full list of questions for every individual who enters the facility, follow the guidelines for if symptoms are present or if temperatures above threshold, monitor staff, self-check in the back to make sure staff are completing self-temperature checks. So doing that is gonna help us prevent spread of COVID-19 in the facility. And all of your strategies are what are going to aid in you accomplishing your goal. So that's, that's kind of how we've always done it. And what it does is it makes it really easy to set it up for this next piece, your program evaluation. So your evaluation is how did we do? How did we do in the year prior? Did we do good? Did we do bad? Did we even look at how we did? So program evaluation works in that capacity. So CMS says it like this. The infection control officer can provide evidence that problems identified in the program are addressed with ongoing evaluation and interventions and limited for success. So what we did worked. Uh, Joint Commission says the hospital evaluates the effectiveness of its infection prevention and control plan. plan excuse me. Um, now, what does, what's the problem with surveys? So most times the evaluation um, is just not done. At the end of the year, we're so busy, we just forget to evaluate what we were doing, and we really don't have anything saying, did we do good, did we do, good? Did we do bad, or did we reach our goals? Um, what you want to do is you want to make sure we document the success. You know, your surveyors are going to ask you, what are you proud of in your program? Uh, and if we have no data or no evidence to back up what we did and what we're moving forward with, then that's where your issues come in. Um, again, the biggest issue is that these are not complete or the goals that are reached Say we set our flu vaccine compliance for 90, which uh, let's be real, this year was almost impossible. Um, say we couldn't get there. Well, that would be something we want to carry over into the new year. But let's just say we hit that. That's something that's not as much of a priority. We can set that as a goal, but we, we really don't want to put that as a high priority if we were able to hit those goals. We want to change something up that we feel is more important that we need to focus on. So program evaluation, like I said, a lot of times what we do is we take the strategies and we just abstract those and pull them over into our evaluation. So, you know, what you need to do is evaluate your strategies and say, hey, the screening at the door, how did we accomplish that? Hey, limiting visitation, how did we accomplish that? And at the bottom, what you can do, what you see in this other page, is you can give a synopsis of where you were. So for this one, you can see we wanted to improve the staff influenza vaccination rate to 90%. And you can see at the bottom, overall flu vaccine compliance as of January was low for all staff in 2021. So it was not good. We did not hit 90. And then it gives a little bit more information as to what was going on. Uh, we're going to get a complete percentage in March. But this, this is an easy way for us to, for a surveyor to look over and say, okay, this is what they were shooting at doing. This is all the strategies that they did. And this was the result of that. So are we carrying that forward? Or did we accomplish what we were setting out to do? So program evaluation is a huge piece, uh, especially with Joint Commission, but with the state as well. They're going to ask you what you did well and if it was successful. So, Danae, if we can, I'd like to take our first poll. Uh, first poll is going to be, have you updated your big three for 2022? So, have you done your program plan? Have you done your risk assessment? Have you identified your goals? And have you evaluated the previous year? Um, 
So we'll, we'll take a few seconds to have that poll. I know a lot of the times, you know, these are things, especially when we're working on our day to day that, um, you know, maybe some elements weren't completed or maybe we're just changing some dates on those things. But whatever that is, we always recommend that you make sure you have these big three in place. Um, most times we say with the big three and the acknowledgement, this is something that you can literally, once you abstract these and you get a plan to move forward, these are things tabbed out. You just put that on a shelf and you only change those if they are warranted. So we got a few answers um, and then Danae will give it five more seconds and then we will rock and roll. Okay, so no, looks good. So I see, uh, I see we've got, you know, three folks that voted yes, they've updated those and one that voted no. Look, it's no problem. As long as you and, and your timeline, you know, we say to do these annually, but these things can happen at any time. You know, you can update your pol or your plan. Um, you can do your risk assessment, identify those things, and you can always start from any point in the year. You just want to make sure that you're doing those. If you don't have any data, I will tell you this. In an evaluation, if you don't have any data, you can just put what you know happened. Um, COVID-19, that was a huge piece, is just put down what you did for COVID-19, what else you did in-house, um, and that you're going to set your goals to, to move forward with those and track those. So, um, I do want to give that reassurance. If you haven't done that, it's it's never too late to get those things knocked out. Okay, so that was the first piece. Next thing that we're going to go into is policy and procedure. So the paperwork section, those big items, um, we walked through that. Now we're going to talk through policy and procedure. And what I want to do is I know we are about, let's see, 30 minutes in. So I wanna make sure we get through all these policy and procedures and we have time at the end for questions. So I'm going to roll through these fairly quickly, uh, talk about the high points on these. And then also, like I said, we're gonna give a template policy set uh, on our website whenever we send out a follow-up of this webinar so that you can see what I'm talking about and you can go in and if you have policies, maybe you can add some things to those or if you don't have any policies or you feel like they're outdated, these are some that you can put into place as well. All right, so the inner workings of your facility. So with policy and procedure, um, there's a couple things that we always recommend. Number one, you want to have policy and procedure on every element of your infection control program in your facility. So all the things that pertain to infection prevention and control, we want to make sure um, that we have those in place. Um, second thing, annual update and approval. So policy and procedures, um, most facilities that we work with is we evaluate those policies on an annual basis. We look to see if we need to add anything or edit anything. And then also we have to get a, a facility approval from either the governing body or the medical med exec to make sure that we can move forward with those things. And then also with your policy and procedure is not only do we wanna do them, not only do we want them to be accurate, uh, but we want them available for staff. So think through, is there a way that your staff have access to these things to when they have something like, oh, we've got a patient with scabies and I'm not familiar with that. It's at night at about two in the morning and I have no idea what to do. Have that policy set ready or have them trained as to where they can access that policy on the intranet so that they can follow those steps to keep themselves safe and to mitigate spread of that. So those are the three things. Now, I will say this with policies. Um, I've read a ton in my, my career, and the one thing you want to make sure that you do is you want to make sure you don't back yourself into a corner. Now, Taylor, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is if you've got policies that are so specific that say, for example, we clean the bed, uh, we pull one wipe with the right hand, uh, and we wipe three times to the left, three times to the right, and we dispose of in a trash can on the left wall of the, of the main hall. Way too specific. Um, what happens here is the regulator, if ever there is an issue that they're looking at a practice and they come back uh, or they find something wrong, they're always going to say, well, let me read your policy. They're going to verify that you're following your policy and your procedure. And if you're not, that comes in the form of a deficiency. So when you're looking at your policies, you know, we always recommend when it comes to cleaning, say we clean per manufacturer's guidelines. That's an easy way for you to say, well, what are your manufacturer's guidelines? And we can talk through the process. Um, it is better to talk, be able to talk through the process than for them to go in and be able to nail you down to one thing in your policy and then have one instance that wasn't right. And then, you know, that's something that they're going to say you're not following. 
So that's the big on that. Okay, first policy we talk about is reportable diseases. Now, where, where am I getting all of these references from? I will say this. What I'm going to share you a link for uh, is number one, it's going to be this. This is the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services Hospital Infection Control Worksheet. Uh, I'll put a link in uh, on our website for you to have access to that. Uh, but when it comes to CMS, when it comes to what the state's looking for, those are going to be the guidelines and the checklist that you that CMS put out there. It's really easy for you to go through and check off to see where you are. Uh, but that's where all of these are coming from. And we're following right down that list to talk about those things. Joint Commission. If you are joint commission, uh, you've got access to your portal and you will see all those standards with the EPs lined out. What I did on this is I made sure to pull the EPs that were relatable to the CMS regs so that we could talk through those. So first thing is reportable diseases. So you need to make sure from a CMS perspective um, that you have an updated list of diseases that are reported to local or state public health, and you need evidence that you comply with all the reportable disease requirements. Joint Commission says it like this, we need to report infection surveillance, prevention, and control information to local, state, federal, public health authorities in accordance with law and regulation. So what do we recommend on this policy? Number one, have a policy on reportable diseases, but number two, make sure you attach a copy of the state reportable diseases to your policy. Easy way to get that is go to uh, Louisiana Reportable Diseases, OPH, Google that, and it'll pull up the sheet for you. Um, attach that to the back of your policy that, so that you can reference. Uh, second thing is make sure that you have a relationship with your local office of public health. They're a great resource. They can help you whenever you need to report something. If you're a fairly new preventionist on learning the who to call, where to send it to, what forms to use. Uh, also, when you're getting into this, and much easier way to do this is through IDRIS. That is the state's digital infection uh, disease reporting information system. So, uh, you know, especially with your policy, you want to have all those things that speak to how we report those. You want to have your reference from Louisiana, and then you want to get signed on by IDRIS to make sure that you're reporting those in a timely manner. Next thing is going to be um, outbreak investigation and influx. So this was a huge topic um, when it came to COVID-19, and this is what the Joint Commission has to say this. CMS necessarily doesn't have anything that specifically pertains to this, but Joint Commission says this. Hospital needs to describe in writing the process for investigating outbreaks of infectious disease. We need to prepare for an influx. We need to get the clinical information from our resources about a potential, if it's in our community, if we have the possibility for an influx. We need to have methods to communicate if things are starting to happen in our facility or in our communicate. Uh, or communicate about what we know about emerging diseases or get information. And the last thing is how will we respond? So outbreak policy, the big things we want to make sure is in an outbreak, uh, well, first off, an outbreak is any instance of more than two cases. So if you've got um, rotavirus and you've got more than two cases that happen in your facility, you got, you got yourself an outbreak. If you've got food poisoning or, or if you've got C. diff and you've got it spread, now you got more than two cases, now you got an outbreak from that source. Um, you wanna make sure that you're, you have the ability to take patients, number one. So if they've got something that's uh, airborne uh, precaution to where we don't have an isolation room, do we have the resources to take those patients? You know, many behavioral health hospitals that we work with, they don't have that ability or they don't have the capacity to take that many. So number one, identify if you can take those. And then the second thing is have a step-by-step -step plan as to what we'll do. You know, will we shut off one entrance? Will we, uh, you know, make sure to isolate those folks in a certain area of the hospital? Will we uh, have resources for PPE? So think through that on your outbreak investigation policy, but you want to make sure that you have one that talks about your process. Next thing is transfer communication. So Joint Commission puts it like this. When the hospital becomes aware that it's transferring a patient who has an infection that requires either monitoring, treatment, or isolation, we let the other facility know. Same thing goes for us. When we become aware that we got a patient in that had an infection, we need to make sure that we communicate to the referring organization that they did have that. This was a huge thing during COVID-19 that we were having patients transferred in, we would test them in house and they were positive. We had to let that facility know. Also, if, if some, you know, someone is transferred uh, or if we transferred out a patient and we didn't know about something, uh, the other facility has a responsibility to let us know. So we need to have a policy talking about what that transfer communication looks like. Uh, 
my recommendations on this and the issues that we've seen is make sure that you get a thorough report um, and that appointed admission, all systems are assessed. You know, whenever we get patients in that are for one thing, uh, we may not be looking at other systems. You know, say they came in with uh, COPD exacerbations, okay? Um, but we didn't do a, a thorough skin assessment. And later on down the line, they had a, had a pressure sore that was never mentioned. And now it's, you know, later down the road, we find this. Now that's something that uh, we may have to say that, you know, look, we didn't know the patient had that. Could that have happened in the facility? We have no way of proving that. So you want to make sure you're getting a thorough report on what you're getting in. And that also you do a thorough assessment uh, whenever someone comes in and you communicate what you find if it was not communicated to you to that other facility. Next thing is construction, infection control risk assessment. This is something a lot of the times facilities don't even know that this exists. Um, it's not an infection control standard for Joint Commission. It is more of an environment of care deal. So your department or uh, your, uh, your DPO, direction of plan ops or your maintenance director, this would be something that uh, when they're doing construction that if he doesn't know about it, it's just not gonna be done. So. Uh, having a policy on construction. CMS says you need to have policies and procedures on construction, renovation, maintenance, demolition, and repair uh, to make sure you include an ICRA whenever you define the process and then what steps you need to take in that process. Joint Commission says you need to manage the risks associated with the utility systems. So what do you need to do as a preventionist when it pertains to this policy is number one, have a policy on construction. Uh, number two, have an infection control risk assessment uh, attached to your policy so that you can reference and you can perform. Now, this is a very easy step-by-step -step process where you are looking at, number one, what is the scope of the project that they're doing? Are they um, moving a ceiling tile to change it because it was leaky? Are they um, busting out a wall or, or busting out a floor? And there's going to be dust and stuff everywhere, interruption with your water. You need to see what type of construction you're doing. Number two is what area it affects. Um, is it, a, uh, is it a, a clerical office or is it a med surge unit or is it surgery? Different things need to happen. You need to make sure uh, that you do those with your construction team, your director of plan ops, or anyone else that's involved in the construction. You may be the leader on this because they may not know that they need to do this. A lot of times in rural Louisiana, we see that uh, we put bids out, contractors get these bids, and then they've never worked in healthcare before, never put up a barrier, don't know what a HEPA filter is. You want to make sure that you run point on that and that they're doing all those things that you Also, um, evidence. So when you have a surveyor in house and they see construction going on, they're going to absolutely ask for your ICRAs. Uh, you want to make sure that you have copies. I always say in a separate binder for quick reference, but you also give those to your contractor. Uh, a lot of time the contractor may have these and may do these, uh, but also you want to make sure that you have copies. All right, moving on, multi-drug resistant organisms. Um, so this is a policy that uh, CMS requires. You know, you wanna make sure that you have a policy in place. You wanna make sure that you've got a way to designate if someone's colonized or if they're infected with a multi-drug resistant organism and how you communicate that. Um, you know, you have to have systems in place to make sure that the receiving facility, if we're transferring, like we talked about in our transfer policies there, um, and that those folks uh, are aware of what they're getting. You need to make sure you have a list of the multi-drug resistant organisms, which I have a list over here on the right side um, that you address in your facility. You need to make sure that you can determine the criteria used, uh, how you, know, you selected those, why are those important? Have you seen those and have you not seen those? Uh, also, you need to make sure you have a system uh, to identify them. How do you culture? How do you get those cultures back? Do you have the ability to make sure that you can get a strain? Um, and then do you have a way to be notified? Once those come back, are you the point person? Are you notified that a way you can take uh, action? Uh, also is, you know, are they placed on the proper precautions? Once you're notified, are they placed on the proper precautions? So with multi-drug uh, resistant organisms, these are, these are you know, the, the things that we really do not wanna face, but they're out there. 
you want to make sure that if you're seeing those a lot, they're in your risk assessment, but you've got a process behind how those patients are treated, what the notification looks like, and you've got it all detailed out in your policy. Uh, next thing, huge topic, huge topic, especially for the Joint Commission, since this is something they've recently pushed out. CMS and the CDC have had core elements out for a good little while right now, but antibiotic stewardship. So um, CMS says you need policy and procedure. They said you need to have leaders designated to do it. You need to have um, documentation in the medical record. If you're making any changes, you need to have 48 hour reviews and you need to make sure you monitor those. Joint Commission has a laundry list of things that you need to have when it comes to antibiotic stewardship. So what I will say about this, number one with antibiotic stewardship, you need to make sure that you have a policy that includes all of the core elements of that. Um, those core elements, I'll put a link uh, to that worksheet that was put out about the core elements and what those details are in that antibiotic stewardship program. Um, but other things you need to make sure you have are three key aspects. So in the core elements, it talks about leadership commitment. So you need to make sure that your facility acknowledges that we are working on antibiotic stewardship. You've got a medical professional that says that they are gonna work with the medical staff to make sure that they are being good stewards of antibiotics and write their orders complete uh, and per guidelines. And then also you need pharmacy backing to say, look, we have the formulary, uh, we're going to review these antibiotics to make sure they're appropriate, and we are going to, uh, you know, hold the, hold the practitioners and infection control responsible for, uh, you know, either decreasing the antibiotics we write or making sure the call is correct and we do write those. Um, multidisciplinary buy-in involvement. So we need, we need to have pharmacies buy-in. We need to have them have an eye on that, which this is a medication management standard. It falls under pharmacy. Um, we need medical buy-in. So if we've got medical nurse practitioners or uh, medical staff that's in-house, maybe they're contracted, maybe they're hospitalists, um, we need their buy-in to make sure that they're looking at these things and doing a review after 48 hours to make sure that these things are appropriate. And the last thing that we've seen that the surveyors really like is consistency. So in a small rural hospital, the problem we have a lot of times is maybe we don't have a pharmacist, a full-time pharmacist. Um, maybe we really don't see a whole lot of, you know, antibiotics or we can review those antibiotics, but we don't know how to track them past that. Um, or we don't have a set of guidelines that we are really looking to see if we're writing for best practice. One of the biggest things that I've, I've seen the surveyors love is the consistency. And I put a little sheet, what we've done at a facility before is if we have conditions, have we looked into what's in our formulary and what is recommended uh, per evidence-based practice as to what we want to write? Um, if we haven't, it's good to get medicals buy-in. It's good to get pharmacists buy-in. It's good to have that set list because what you don't want is you don't want, um, say for UTIs, your antibiotics to be written across the board and there to be no consistency. So that's something that I always recommend in antibiotic stewardship. But again, Antibiotic stewardship is as small as putting a flyer on the wall saying that we're paying attention to as big as a full-blown program that's involved with all the disciplines. As long as you are working to stop those antibiotics when they're not needed, make sure that the therapy is being completed, make sure that all those elements are there, then your program is going to uh, pass. Next thing is ICP education. So Joint Commission says everyone needs to have job specific training as to what they're gonna deal with. And then they also say that those competencies, if they're gonna be doing any specialized task in their job, they need to have competencies to make sure that they are proficient in how to do those items. Joint Commission says it like this, they just need to implement their infection prevention and control plan. So what does that mean? The compliance tips that we're going to give are number one, make sure you've got education provided to all your staff upon hire and annually. That could be in the form of a health stream, a digital platform, or it can be through just an orientation class that is taught by the preventionist. Um, also, job specific training needs to be specialized to the position and the department. What we're going to teach our housekeepers is not the same thing that we're going to teach a registered nurse in surgery. So we need to make sure that the, the training is specific to the area and it covers all the things that they may encounter. Um, also with your competencies, you need to make sure that those competencies are done annually for any job specific task. Um, you know, COVID-19 testing was one of those competencies that we would need to have for a nurse if you were doing it in-house. Um, another would be using glucometers, another would be 
any clinical task that a nurse would do. They need to be competent on those items. Uh, and we need to have documentation of that. And a great time, we always say there's a great time to do this is if you've got a skills fair, do that education, do that quick education right there. Um, and then have those competencies to where they can knock those out at the skills fair. You can get it all done at one time. Also, if you got time, throw in the flu vaccines, throw in your TB uh, test documentation. You can get a lot done in a skills fair, but especially with the education piece, we feel that this is a great place to do it. Um, when it comes to any education that you see that needs to happen, say you've got an issue with um, cleaning, or you've got an issue with storage, you can do those educational in services. The one thing you want to make sure you do is that you document those and you get the signatures of your staff. So education that's done, but not documented is not done. So anything that we do when it comes to education, you want to document that. Um, exposure control plan. So when we talk about exposure control plan, we're talking about the systems that train what what happened, you know, what, what the risks are, we're going to be potentially exposed to blood, body fluids, anything like that. Um, we put things in place to make sure that we mitigate that as much as possible. Um, we monitor those. And then also we've got resources available that if we did have an exposure event that uh, the staff would be taken care of, they would get the right treatment. Joint Commission also says it like this. Uh, we want to work to prevent transmission of infection with licensed staff that are suspected of having or had exposure. We need to make sure that we have uh, resources for them, prophylaxis or counseling. And then with patients that have been exposed, we have to have that. Biggest thing with your exposure control plan is to make sure that you have a step-by-step -step packet. This is the one thing we see missing everywhere. You got a step-by-step -step packet talking about if there was an exposure, here are the things that need to be done. Here are the consents that need to be signed. Having that exposure packet is an easy way to document that you're doing everything and uh, will include you know, everything you need that if you did have something happen, you can keep track of where you are in the process. But that's our biggest recommendation on that. Employee health, these are the things for employee health. You want to make sure everybody is screened for TB upon hire and annually. Uh, also, if they've uh, had previous exposure that, you know, we're doing what we need to do in the form of a chest x-ray or whatever, uh, whatever we need to do on the TB test. Uh, also, the folks with conversion, they're followed up on. When it comes to Hep B, we need to make sure that all staff have either access to the Hep B series um, they give us proof that they previously had hep, uh, the Hep B series or they sign a declination. We have to have some kind of proof. And the last thing are, you know, CMS also talks about measles, mumps, rubella, Tdap evidence and evidence of immunity from varicella. Uh, those things are not as scrutinized by the state, but it is something that CMS says. Uh, and then Joint Commission, they want to make sure that we screen for exposure and immunity to these infectious diseases to protect our staff. Now, what the state of Louisiana has always looked for when they came in to look at our employee health files are these things. Number one, TB test upon hire annually. Um, since we are a low risk state, your TB test can be done in a fashion that you want to upon hire, but then after that, all you have to do is a questionnaire. So the two-step or the interferon goal that does not have to happen each year, it is per the state of Louisiana that you can do a questionnaire. Now, if you've got special cases where they need to do chest x-rays or your policy says different, then absolutely, but that is the minimum requirement. Uh, hep B, you've got to have either proof of vaccination, um, the attempt for those folks to go get that series through you, or declination. You just have to have some kind of documentation of that. Uh, COVID-19 vaccination or exemption, that is 100% looked at at every survey that we've dealt with in the past year since the mandate went into effect. So have your documentation, any new hires, make sure that you're covering those for employee health. And then the last thing, influenza vaccination, which regulators understand we had a horrible year for flu vaccination. Even if your rate is low, you want to talk about what you're going to be doing in the next year to help increase that. Education is the answer. Education is what you can do. Also, you can offer incentives, but we'll talk about that here in a few. But those are the main things State of Louisiana and Joint Commission are going to look for. Uh, respiratory protection. So OSHA, this has come up because some facilities um, did not have isolation rooms and they were using N95s but did not have fit testing. CMS says that you have to have systems to ensure the hospital has a respiratory protection program. This is basically off of your OSHA standard. Uh, you want to make sure that anytime we use a respiratory that requires fit testing, that the fit testing is done. And the policy talks about 
uh, contact personnel with patients uh, when they have potentially transmittable conditions. So knowing when that we need these respirators, and we talk about that a little bit more in transmission precautions, but for respiratory protection, I would start with OSHA to make sure that you have a respiratory pro, uh, protection program that talks about fit testing. All right, influenza vaccination. So again, regulators understand we had a huge problem with this. Whenever we're looking at, you know, there was a post out on Facebook about um, we had 36, average of 36 million cases for the past three, four years, and all of a sudden we had 1,800 cases. Well, if you ask me, I think the masks worked. They played a part. I think hand hygiene played a part. But what it did do is it absolutely decimated our staff's uh, your willingness to get an influenza vaccination. Maybe it was because they already got uh, the COVID vaccine. They didn't want another one, or maybe they don't believe in it. Whatever it is, um, you know, they understand it's a problem. Now, we do have to have a program in place, and we also need to make sure that we are setting thresholds. So you can see CMS just wants you to offer that, but in, for, in the former Joint Commission, you want to make sure that we offer it. Uh, there's many times that they can go and get this flu vaccination. Um, it's accessible. You got, it's in your infection control plan with your rates. You're looking to get a percentage. You want to try to increase those. Uh, also, we need to evaluate why they are not getting that and then have a way to communicate what our vaccination rate is to our key stakeholders. So a, a few good things. Now, what we've seen that's helped or that regulators look for is number one, that you're doing it. You got a program, you're offering that, uh, and you've got documentation of who has it, who didn't, or who declined. Uh, and then uh, for, for your staff, always an incentive has been helpful. I work with a facility and a shirt, a t-shirt that says I got the flu shot has increased percentages as high as 40%. So, I mean, if, if a t-shirt, a small investment, you may want to work with your organization and say, hey, look, a small investment can get our vaccination rate fairly high. I think this would be good. Um, but also another thing is be mobile. You set up a cart to where you can roll through your hospital and say, hey, flu vaccines, let's get it. You want one? We'll go ahead and knock out the documentation and we'll give you a flu shot right here. Being mobile has been much better than being stationary in an office. And uh, we can attest to that because we do help give vaccinations out at some of our facilities and, and going out there, staff have a lot to do on a daily basis. Going to them has helped increase our compliance. All right, hand hygiene, huge thing. If we don't have a policy on this in the facility, we, <laughs> that's the first priority, we need to do that. Hand hygiene is a huge thing. Biggest thing with this, CMS says you have to have it, you gotta know when to do it. Um, and those are all great things to put in your policy, joint commission, it is a national patient safety goal. So they absolutely want you to use national guidelines to do this. Um, what do you need to know? They're gonna ask you what guidelines you follow. So do you follow CDC? Do you follow who and what is in your policy that it says that you follow? And the, the other things that we can mention is secret shopper observations are the best. Now, surveyors understand and they know that 100% is not a good thing. You know, we like to think that it's a good thing. And then when we have departments looking at their department, they're gonna give you 100%, but we want a accurate view of what that looks like. Uh, some folks have gone digital, some folks have had secret shoppers, some are just doing it themselves. Um, whatever it may be, the biggest thing is to make sure that you are getting multiple observations, uh, multiple different places, and that um, when you are noticing non-compliance that you are educating on that. Um, you know, you may see that it's being done uh, on the floor, but then when you go to uh, med prep or when they're giving meds, it may not be done how you need to give it. It's a big deal is figuring out where that, that is lacking because it's such a huge piece. Um, those supplies as well. You want to make sure your supplies are available. I know some facilities have done the little keychain uh, sanitizer. That's a real good thing to do just to increase compliance. But again, behavioral health is a different animal. Make sure that you know whatever you're doing is, is also keeping that patient safe. Okay, fingernails, huge scrutiny over fingernails. It's one of the easiest thing for surveyors to find. So uh, CMS does require that you have something in policy about wearing artificial fingernails, extenders, so when you're in contact with patients. Here's what we always recommend. We always recommend the policy to state that we endorse the CDC guidelines and educate staff if this continues to be an issue. Once you mandate this, this allows them to cite you on one occurrence. Um, again, remember, we don't want to back ourselves in a corner. So with fingernails, really think through about how you phrase that in your policy of what is required. 
Um, and if, if it is absolutely required, how are you making sure that it's being done? Um, that's been, you know, something that some of the newest surveyors that we've worked with that are new to state organizations, this is something easy for them to go look at and something that they can easily find if it is a requirement. Next thing, sharp safety. So biggest things with sharp safety is one patient. And I know we've heard this over and over again, but when your injections are prepared, we want to make sure it's in an aseptic, you know, area. Uh, syringe is only one patient. Uh, needles are only for one patient. Insulin pins are only for one patient. So you'll see a lot of what CMS talks about is we need to make sure that these are for one patient. They talk about scrubbing the hub, making sure that before you do anything that you clean that area or if that vial is a multi-dose medication that we're wiping that top before we enter it with a new needle and a new syringe. Uh, we change those every time. And then also for sharp safety, we want to make sure that we are safely disposing of sharps. And what that looks like is making sure that you've got sharps containers present in your areas where you are using sharps, whether that's needles, whether that's scalpels, it could be a suture removal kit. I mean, we want to make sure that we're throwing them away in rigid containers and that also we are emptying those whenever they are three quarters full. You can look at the picture at the bottom. You can see the line. Whenever your sharps are at the line, you want to throw it away. What happens is we're rushing. It's over the line. We go to put a, a needle in there. There was one sticking out. Boom. That's how a needle stick happens. It happens every day. It's so easy. We want to make sure that we're being conscious about that. And we talk to our department managers of changing that. Now, things that have gotten us in trouble. Okay. Knowing where the key is. So there's a key that opens those things so that you can remove the box and replace the box. Where's the key? You know, make sure you know where the key is. And then also making sure you empty um, whenever the full line is there. Some folks have processes where they take the top um, and then they take them the biohazard, whatever your process is, make sure that you are following that. Okay, next thing, transmission-based precautions, which this is a huge piece of when COVID came in, is knowing when to use these. Uh, so CMS talks about all the adherence with standard precautions. You know, your PPE, your gloves, gowns, mouth, eyes, nose, face protection. And they've got a good section on that. They also have a good section in what I'm sharing with you in that checklist about contact precaution, about droplet precaution, and about airborne precautions. So all of those things have different items that you're going to look at, how to keep those patients, what to wear. You need to make sure that you have policies on all of those. So standard, contact, droplet, and airborne. You want to have policies if you have one big policy, that's fine, but you want to have things detailing out what those expect. Um, Joint Commission says you need to use standard precautions uh, whenever, you know, with everyone, and then also that we implement transmission-based precautions whenever they're warranted. I'll put over here a little checklist. It talks about some specific isolation recommendations. I think it's great to have in your policy that those are items that you want to make sure that those things are in place. And you can also see N95 in your airborne precautions. So that's, that's another piece, uh, like I said, to the right. They need, your staff need to know where your PPE is located and they need to know where to get more and what size they're in 95. So if it's an airborne and they've been fit tested, do they know their size? Another good question. Housekeeping, of course, um, CMS wants to make sure that we are cleaning with the proper chemicals, that we are cleaning all rooms uh, after they're used or when they're visibly soiled. Um, that we are separating clean cloths and we're using different items for different rooms, uh, that if we have a blood spill or a spill of body fluids, that we are containing those, uh, that also that we follow a schedule, which this is a big piece, on cleaning things like your HVAC, your ice machines, your eye wash uh, stations, and your scrub sinks. Those are things that a lot of times uh, housekeeping may not be over. Those are big pieces that CMS look for. Always, also, Joint Commission looks for to minimize the risk of storing and disposing of infectious waste. They want to make sure that those are separated properly. And then also, we implement infection prevention and control activities when storing medical equipment, devices, and supplies. So our recommendation, step-by-step -step policy that correlates with turning a room over. So if it's a room that needs to be cleaned, brand new room, how do we do that? Top to bottom, in to out, what does that look like? If it's a patient that needs to, uh, that was there that we need to turn it over, I would have step-by-step. Step. What you can do is you can correlate that to your housekeeping checklist so that you can make sure those things are being done. But if your housekeeping staff doesn't know what to do, then they're just gonna do whatever. So if there's special areas you want them to look at, like underneath the mattress 
or cleaning the top of monitors that collect dust. You want to make sure that you have a checklist and you educate them on that. Um, low level disinfection. I know we are going on about an hour, so I'm going to try to get through all of these really quickly. Uh, low level disinfection. So CMS says that we need to make sure that we clean with the proper disinfection wipe and that we use those according to manufacturer's guidelines. That is the biggest takeaway right here is, you know, anything like reusable blood pressure cuffs, oximeters, or whenever we have a patient on contact precautions, or, you know, any, any medical device that we use that has patient contact, we clean those in between patients and we do it for the proper contact time. Uh, Joint Commission also says we want to reduce the risk of infection with medical equipment, devices, and supplies, and this is the way to do it. Easy way to do it is circle the contact time on the bottle. You can see on the purple bottle, there's a two. You can see on the orange bottle, there's a four. There's a three on the gray one. Just circle that with an Expo marker or with a Sharpie. And that way it's easy to recollect, but your staff needs to make sure they know what that is when they're asked so that they can, uh, you know, they can do it properly if they are asked to clean an item. Um, so that's the big thing on low level disinfection. When it comes to laundry management, there's two things that you want to look at. Um, do you let staff do or do you let your, um, your patients do their laundry? Um, this happens in some environments. Uh, do you have an in-house launder? which at that point you want to make sure when you're handling laundry, you don't agitate it or you don't spread things that your soiled linen is separated from your clean linen and that anything that's, uh, that's soiled or contaminated, we are put in a negative pressure room in a dirty linen room uh, that's built out for that. Um, with your clean linen, you want to make sure that that is stored in a clean area. You want to make sure that is covered if it is stored with other things. If it is in an individual room, it can be stored by itself, not covered. Um, and the Joint Commission says we just need policies on our linen handling. You know, um, if you have a contractor, which you can see over here, uh, you want to get your reports from your vendors. You want to make sure, you know, there was an instance that happened in New Orleans at a children's hospital where the vendor was not checked on. There was a fungus that spread and they had bad outcomes with some children that went to the hospital. Um, it was all because we didn't keep tabs on those folks. If you've got a outside source that's doing your linen, make sure you keep tabs on those folks or they give you reports. Um, even if you wanted to do a walkthrough, if you're looking at making that option, I would always recommend a walkthrough and asking all those questions. COVID-19 policies. So this is the last one that we're really going to focus on as an absolute that needs to happen. You know, you need to make sure that with your COVID-19 policies on your right side, you can see that uh, the elements we've seen that surveyors are looking for, COVID-19 plan. Absolutely what we talk about from um, what's going to happen when they come in the facility, how we're going to isolate those folks, the guidelines, what we're going to use to clean, all of that needs to be in your COVID-19 plan. Also, you can touch on if you need to isolate a unit for, to make that a COVID-19 unit, um, that's, that's what you want to do. Uh, COVID-19 vaccination, um, that you want to make sure you have a policy on that and what you're keeping up on that. COVID-19 screening and masking, of course, there's a, there's a lot of stuff out there about masking and screening. We put a video out recently talking about what the state is expecting, what the accrediting body is expecting, and all those things. And then also your workplace guidelines. What's our return to work? Uh, how are we proving if we're a high-risk facility? Um, what are your workplace guidelines for return, safe return to work and what is required? Uh, also link the Joint Commission COVID-19 resource page. Um, that's uh, got a ton of information for you. But uh, the things that I'm going to say here are keep up the great work. You're doing a great job. We're all learning through this process. And uh, although we see COVID peaking its head again, um, make sure that uh, you keep up the good work. Now, what you want to do is make sure you follow your policy. So when it comes to COVID-19, if you've got issues, they're going to go straight to your policy or your plan. And you need to make sure that your plan is updated with what is current. Is your return to work correct? Is your screening process correct? Is your isolation process correct? Just go back in that policy or when you're writing this policy, make sure that it is 100% what you're actively doing. Other policies that we've seen, great things to have. And like I said, I'm gonna link you to uh, our list that we always put together for hospitals or rural hospitals or pest control, uh, storage under the sink, always an issue and something that you wanna mitigate. Uh, ice machines, cleaning, um, you know, uh, how, how, to, how to, you know, distribute ice throughout a unit, those things, light scabies, bed bugs, the guidelines and the step-by-step, -step. 
clean and sterile storage, let's look for eye wash stations, volunteers, whether you've got students or whether you've just got volunteers in general, uh, what's required for them. Uh, specimen collection, I see quality improvement, what's your quality process, what are you required to report, or what are you looking at uh, when it comes to that, and that's going to be on our next webinar that we talk about your quality and your, uh, your action plans. Um, I see resources, what resources do you have that you can access quickly, uh, cleaning blood spills, patient room turnover, and then patient slash family education. This is something Joint Commission likes to see, but these are all great policies to have. So, Danae, if we can do a, uh, if we can do a poll about the policies and procedures, um, how many of y'all have had your policies and procedures updated and approved for 2022? So everything that you feel is in your policies and it is accurate. So, perfect. So we'll give it, give it a few more seconds. But already we're looking at, um, you know, three no's that if the positive procedures have been updated and approved for 2022. So again, never too late. Um, these are great things to have. Uh, like I said, we hit on the high topics here. Uh, you can take this, go back, look at your policy, see if there's anything you need to add, but also we'll be sharing that resource for you. Um, so that is good. And then Danae, can we pop up the other one uh, that asks, is there, um, is there one thing, I will get out of this one, is there one thing that you learned today um, that you can take and uh, put into place? Is there one thing we talked about that you feel like that you could take and you can go and either check on or, um, or you know, see if uh, you have it in place or you can go update or you can get some information on? Is there one thing that, uh, that you learned? All right, great. Now we got three, four. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, give it a few more seconds. Okay, perfect. Yep, so we've got five that voted that at least one thing that we learned today, they can go verify or adjust in their facility. That's that's perfect. And that is the reason we are doing this is we are trying to bring to light anything that uh, may be new to you as a new preventionist or maybe just something, man, I really need to go check on that. Um, so no, that's a great deal. So, all right, excellent, excellent. Okay, so just wanting to remind everyone um, of a few things. So here's our webinar dates. We talked about uh, rural hospitals June 15th. So hey, if, if any of the hospitals have rural health clinics and they feel like they can benefit from that, on June 28th, we've got our first RHC webinar about infection prevention and control. Um, like I said, RHCs do have certain things that they're held to for standards. So we're going to shed light on that. And then on July 14th, we've got our second basic. So on that second basic, and uh, you can take this down, we're going to be focused on the process. So we're going to be talking about the practice that you have, whether it's environmental rounds, what we need to look for, checklist to have there, uh, whether it's documentation for our antibiotic stewardship program from our quality perspective, what do we need to be tracking in our quality, uh, you know, in our quality data, and then what to do with all of that. So um, that's going to be on our next basic which will be on July 14th. Um, and then you can just uh, bookmark the rest of the dates. Um, Danae actually has these open that you can pre-register. So you can go pre-register for those. Um, also, the assessment application is open. So remember, we've got a on-site element uh, that this grant allows us to do to come visit with you, get to know you more and help you look at your pro uh, program and your facility. Um, so that's a great thing to be involved with, but you got to sign up on, on here to make sure that you can uh, be qualified to be selected. So um, those links are on the website as well, and I'll put that on ours as well. And then last thing is thank you. No, thank you so much uh, for tuning in. I know it was a lot of information today. I tried to cover it the best that I could, but again, um, hopefully we we're able to work with uh, a bunch of folks or a bunch of you that are on here. Um, to really dive deep into your program and to help you uh, in person look at those different things. So, Danae, I'll let you take it from here. All right. Thanks so much, Taylor. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, I did post those links that Taylor mentioned into the chat box. So go find those, the link to our webpage, 
where you can register for the future webinars, learn more information, also the link directly to the application for the on-site assessment. Um, I also posted in the chat a post-session survey link. Um, again, please do take that. We do need that data for our grant evaluation and it helps us to improve our future events. The recording will be on our website within a couple of days. Um, and then uh, the uh, copy of the slides as well um, will be on the website and we will send those out via email. Um, so as always, please feel to reach out to us at LRHA if we can be of any assistance. And thank you so much and have a wonderful day.